Welcome to Foreign Correspondents uh, Deeper into Hitchcock podcast. Uh, my name is Michał Leszczyk and my co-host is... Sebastian Smoliński, hello. Uh, this is the very first episode and we are quite nervous because actually this is the first time we are ever doing a podcast in English. So we are not English speakers. In a second we'll tell you where we come from. But uh, we came up with this idea of doing a Hitchcock podcast devoted to our favorite director, film by film. Uh, and uh, maybe let's start by just introducing ourselves, just by saying to our listeners, who are we? Uh, Sebastian. Um, my name is yes, Sebastian, as I mentioned. I work uh, half time as a film critic. The other half uh, is my, let's say, family company. So I have... Uh, currently, after finishing my studies, I have a lot of time to watch movies and uh, read about them. I also like writing. Writing is my favorite part of uh, movie um, adventure, I would say, that I have with movies. Um, also, I've uh, studied in Ohio for a semester. I'm Americanophile, as we can say, as Hitchcock was, by the way. That's pretty interesting. Uh, so my ties, as well as Michal ties to the U.S., are pretty strong in a way. Probably that's one of the reasons why we chose Hitchcock uh, to do a podcast about. Absolutely, yes. And uh, I, my name is Michał Leszczyk. I'm a film scholar and a critic. Also, I work as a translator. I teach at uh, Artes Liberales uh, Department of uh, University of Warsaw. And uh, Hitchcock was really my first, um, the, the, the director that I first discovered as a very, very young cinephile. After I uh, saw some films at the cinema like Um, Jurassic Park or Home Alone, the current releases, he was probably, along with Chaplin, the very first uh, historical figure from history of film that I became aware of. So, we were talking one day, and uh, since this is a um, anniversary year, because we have 2019, and Alfred Hitchcock was born in 18... 99 in August, and this is August again, uh, one day we decided that we will start a podcast on Hitchcock films. Now it, we are fully aware that there are already podcasts out there about Hitchcock and we love them and uh, we greet and say hello to all of the good people behind the uh, Hitchpod for one and good evening on the other hand, fantastic podcast. But we were thinking that perhaps because we are not American, we are not English, we can bring with ourselves some perspective that um, is sort of like Like an outsider perspective, would you say? What was your beginning of your adventure with Hitchcock? Like, what was the first film that you saw uh, by Alfred Hitchcock, Sebastian? Uh, I, I'm sure I'm, I started with his sound films. Um, probably it was probably it was Psycho or Rear Window, uh, the, the most popular Hitchcock movies, because Hitchcock was all around. I my first memory of Hitchcock, I think, of kind of um, encountering him somewhere is in a um, TV magazine uh, because Hitchcock's movies always had the biggest amount of stars in a magazine. Uh, the small notes written by our Polish film critic Konrad Jodzaremski, who was always a Hitchcock fan. And I remember, you know, this mythical, semi-mythical stories about Hitchcock that, for example, uh, the boy who saw the bears then was so much afraid of pigeons that, you know, he had to run away after the screening, which are nowadays when we look at birds uh, in, in a different way, um, you know, with this 50 plus years of uh, other movies, it's kind of uh, astonishing that his movies worked so well on people. So uh, he always was, you know, he was always always hailed as the master during my time because I'm re rel relatively young cinephiles, I would say. We We, you have 30-something, I'm 20-something, so for us, we, we grew up with Hitchcock as a master. We didn't go through this process of, you know, establishing him as a master that some viewers from uh, since 1930s uh, were going through. Yeah, absolutely, and I would say that it's quite important what you mentioned. I was born in 1982, you were born in 1992, so we are a decade apart. We are great cinephiles, we are friends as well. But also we grew up in a country where, um, and I, mean, I do mean Poland, we are actually... Uh, taping this uh, podcast in Warsaw uh, on a hot August day. Um, we grew up uh, with what you, what you uh, just said, this sort of ready-made 
reputation. We didn't have to be persuaded that Hitchcock was was great. There are usually those, you know, big milestones that are being pointed to when our people are talking about Hitchcock's reputation being sort of forged, and usually it's, you know, pointed to early 60s and uh, Cahiers du Cinema and uh, the MoMA retrospective of his work with the Peter Bogdanovich booklet that he wrote for MoMA in 1962. Then, of course, the huge success of Truffaut, Hitchcock Truffaut book, 1966. Uh, Robin Wood's book, which actually Sebastian brought uh, with him today, published in 1965, that was another milestone. But we didn't have to go through that process, right? We already received Alfred Hitchcock as one of the established masters. And the idea for this podcast is really to go to by film by film to watch all the films that Hitchcock made, actually to rewatch them, because I mm -hmm. think most of them we already saw sometimes even a couple of times. But we decided that uh, since this is the anniversary year and we uh, were look, really looking for an excuse to talk about movies more often and uh, hang out more often, uh, we decided that we will rewatch all of the Hitchcock films and do this podcast one by one. We will discuss all of the surviving Hitchcock's films, starting with The Pleasure Garden, and this will be today's episode, um, and then we'll go uh, film by film. And uh, the, the, the really crucial thing is that we feel that we want to add something to um, the podcasts that are already uh, existing out there, but also we want to bring a specific perspective with us. We are Europeans, we are actually Eastern Europeans, uh, with uh, knowledge of film and uh, with academic background in film. I, uh, As I mentioned, I teach I have a PhD in film studies, so we, all, uh, we want to bring um, all of that. And uh, I feel that Eastern European perspective on Hitchcock is basically non-existent in, in the world uh, film uh, academia. And it's actually funny because uh, before this podcast, I started to read, uh, finally, uh, the biography by John Russell Taylor, the, the very first authorized biography of Alfred Hitchcock, which was published in 1978. And it's very funny because he, in, in that book, he mentions the lost film, um, uh, uh, The Mountain Eagle. And he says something like in this little uh, aside that, uh, oh, you know, Mountain Eagle is lost now, uh, but uh, perhaps one day it will be found in some secluded Eastern European archive. <laughs> so... This the idea great. of, you know, Eastern Europe as being this sort of, like, mm -hmm. dustbin of history where uh, the remnants of film history are... Be well, hopefully, hopefully it will happen, of course. Um, so, before we start discussing the very first film, uh, which we rewatched... When did you rewatch it? I watched it two days ago. Uh, I saw it... Uh, I rewatched it this morning. Okay, okay, <laughs> so you, you have fresh perceptions. Um, what was the first Alfred Hitchcock image image that sort of stuck with you, maybe scared you, uh, I don't know, a frame, like what was your first exposure to this very striking mm. visual imag imagination? Yeah, this is a great question and once again, once again I feel I'm not very original when it comes to Hitchcock because uh, my favorite movie is Vertigo, which is, th there is no bigger cliche since it was hailed the best movie ever made in 2012 by uh, Silent Sound Paul. So that's one thing. And the other, the, the only movie that ever really scared me. I mean, I was really scared um, when I saw Psycho when I was around 15, uh, 14. And once again, it's a movie that many generations have these uh, memories with. You know, you have memories and first viewers have memories that they were really scared by Psycho. And this is incredible because I, I love horror movies. I love noir. I like to be, you know, uh, titillated when watching movies. Uh, I like this uh, thrill and excitement. So Hitchcock is for me the, the perfect director, but really the only movie that I had nightmares with was uh, Nightmares About was, was Psycho. So I would say that uh, Norman Bates in his mother's wig with a knife, um, even, even the, the, the cellar scene, not even the, the shower scene, but when he comes down to the cellar at the end and is, let's say, we can say his identity is finally exposed, although we can assume it. Or her identity. Yes, her identity is exposed. So that's the, the, the scariest image I, I, I remember. Okay. Well, uh, in my case, uh, it was actually um, also Psycho and the Birds uh, 
in the year that you were born, Sebastian, when I was 10, uh, Polish television was uh, doing this um, Tuesday cycle uh, of um, classic films. And uh, it was always at, uh, I think, 8 p.m. It was the screening of, 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 of a classic film. I saw City Lights then. I saw many other films. But um, they, uh, the funny thing is that um, they had a rerun of those films on Wednesday mornings. So if uh, every time I was sick and I didn't go to school, which were, of course, the best days, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would watch the reruns of those films. And I remember very distinctly that The Birds and Psycho were... They had their reruns on, on 10 a.m. Uh, in Polish television, and I do remember that I watched only in fragments. I didn't see the whole films, but I do remember watching the birds especially, and especially the very final scene with all the uh, silent birds uh, perched and waiting okay. was very, very, very unnerving for me. And yes, I was shocked. I, and I, I do remember actually asking my mother about the film, and she you know, told me something about it. Like I, I had a feeling that it was a historical artifact, that, oh, she saw it in the cinema, you know. It was actually something that had a history of its own. Okay, so these are our first impressions. And let's uh, start with The Pleasure Garden, we made in 1925. Actually, a film that is shockingly relevant when it comes to Hitchcock themes, Hitchcock images, uh, including its very, very first scene, which seems to be revealing an already formed sensibility. That very first scene in the theater. How did you take the scene, the, the theater scene with all the pretty girls running down the spiral, spiral staircase? Um, of course, you're totally right. But one thing I want to say is that uh, what is sometimes, I think, um, difficult when you try to reconstruct the director's career is that, of course, the, the most common way is to look in these earlier movies, you know, the, the signs of the master to come. or That's, that's of course, part of the uh, Otera theory, right? That's, that's the way we should do. We should look at the first Hitchcock movie and see what is there that, you know, the future master will explore in his biggest masterpiece. And, of course, The Pleasure Garden is, is a perfect example to, to explore that because, that's right, the very first surviving Hitchcock image, because we, we should say that it's... Not the, it's not the first surviving because he, he was assistant director or replaced uh, some other director on two projects as far as I remember, right? Always tell your, tell, tell your wife, number 13, that Which is, is lost. lost. Which exactly, is lost, yes. so, so you know, this is the first image in the first Hitchcock feature that we can honestly like call Hitchcock feature is the, the, the staircase and uh, young uh, dancers, uh, female dancers coming down the stairs and it's this whirling image that already can, um, you know, um, point us to, to vertigo and all the all the all the spiral spiral images that are in Hitchcock's films. And of course, in the very first scene, which is uh, kind of like like a, a introduction, it's not really already part of the main plot. I would say, of course, we we get to know the the, the heroine, but in this very first scene, there's also male gaze, there is this uh, famous editing uh, that, you know, um, Hitchcock kind of borrowed, we could say, from, from Soviets. So there's this juxtaposition of, of the uh, smiling man and beautiful mm. female, right? He's kind of the, the way Hitchcock transposed the, the Soviet language. So it's already there, we could mm -hmm, say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very important what you said, that uh, we shouldn't be tempted too much to um, go into the, this authorist uh, fetishism, you know, that we will keep pointing to those scenes and saying, oh yes, you know, here's the, <laughs> already the, the, the sensibility is formed, it's Hitchcock already, and you know, I mean, it has its advantages, that approach, but it also has a disadvantage of overlooking a vast um, array of other contexts, especially, as you mentioned, this isn't really Hitchcock's first film, so it's uh, not like he's, you know, consciously opening his oeuvre with, you know, this image, you know, for future generations to be... No, that's that's for one thing. <laughs> and the second thing is also, and this is... Uh, we, we, throughout this podcast, we will keep recommending um, books and articles that you can go to to, um, you know, deepen, deepen your knowledge of Hitchcock and also things that we are reading as we are preparing this podcast because this is also a fantastic opportunity for us to actually read up on things that we have on our shelves 
ourselves and we collected over the years um, to revisit those things. So um, Charles Barr, in his book English Hitchcock, which I highly recommend, points to a very significant um, uh, um, context is that uh, nobody is really discussing Hitchcock's early screenwriters. And uh, he actually points to this man, Elliot Stannard, who will be Hitchcock's screenwriter, actually is a screenwriter on this film, and also will be Hitchcock's screenwriter almost until 1928, until The Manxman. So uh, Barr argues for a strong um, Elliot Stannard uh, influence on all those films. And also, when you look up The Pleasure Garden on IMDb, and you can see Stannard's name next to Oliver Sandys, uh, so that suggests that the novel that the movie was based upon was written by, by a man. Actually, Barr points to the fact that it was a woman under a male uh, pseudonym. So it was a female written novel. And uh, what's most surprising about The Pleasure Garden, because we didn't discuss the plot yet, <laughs> it's a melodrama. Mm -hmm. It's not a suspense film at yeah. all. It's a melodrama. Very brief description, two friends, two dancers, uh, Patsy and Jill. One of them is a good girl, the other one is the bad girl. Yeah, we'll discover that a bit later, of course. Yes, because at the <laughs> beginning it seems that... Uh, that she's the, the, the good girl. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. It seems that, you know, Patsy, who is already dancing in this, you know, sort of vaudeville, which is actually called Pleasure Garden... Uh, that she is, you know, the, the, the all-knowing woman of the world, uh, the city woman, you know, who is possibly corrupt. And the Jill, who comes from the countryside uh, or from a small town, that she's the innocent. And then it all changes. It turns out that it's actually completely the other way around. Uh, and it becomes quite... And this is something I was shocked by mm. at this viewing. It's a, it's a very powerful and lurid and over the top melodrama. I mean, you know, the whole last 15 minutes, you know, in the, in the, in the you know, West Africa with the native woman drowning herself. Yes, this is uh, incredible because we, we could call it this, uh, in a way, colonial kitsch. It's, it's really there. It's, it's very interesting that Hitchcock later, partly, of course, not, not, not forever because we have under Capricorn, um, but he ab abandoned, you know, these colonial settings. We have the, the, man, uh, the new version of The Man Who Knew Too Much, also it's set in uh, Morocco, as far as yes, I remember. Par partially. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, partially. So we can, we can trace these this moments, but then it, what is interesting in this movie, that it's not only, you know, the Hitchcock movie, but it's also the, the perfect product, I would say, of its era, that we still have this British empire, and uh, there are two um, male characters who work overseas, somewhere in the colony, they, they have this job. We don't know where exactly, we just know it's overseas. Yeah, they, they call it the plantation. Oh, the plantation. And, yeah. I, uh, and it's very important what you said, it's a product of this colonial imagination, right? Because Hitchcock was born in 1899, he was a grocery store owner's son, he worked at the grocery store on the outskirts of London, and uh, there's, de there's no denying that he's part of this sort of colonial empire and uh, also the, the sensibilities that mm -hmm. it brought. Uh, and he was an avid reader of novels. He was an avid theater goer. He was going to the theater a lot. So this convention of stage melodrama, uh, you know, with this very, very heightened emotions and, you know, the good versus evil, mm -hmm. you know, the good woman, bad woman, the um, fatal illness, the last minute recovery, the last minute rescue, it's all part of his regular vocabulary. Mm -hmm. he, he knows this. this. Yes. Uh, so he's very apt at, at, at adapting um, this here because there are also two men. One is virtuous, and that's uh, Hugh, played by John Stewart. And one is actually, I think, scary until this day, Levitt, mm -hmm. played by Miles yes. Mander, who, um, whose relationship with Patsy is very, very strange because yes. he basically seduces her, then then uh, kind of abandons her. And this is really interesting. He marries we, her. He marries, he marries her, her right. first, yes. Uh -huh. They have, we could say, not really successful honeymoon because he becomes bored and he shows it right in the middle of this honeymoon. But uh, we should, as, as we mentioned, we don't want to say, you know, this is the, the, the seeds of Hitchcock. And, but, but it really comes to, to your imagination, to your mind, when you look at him, that he's kind of this prefiguration of this uh, gentleman who, who is, uh, whose looks are deceiving, which is, you know, like the, the regular Hitchcock persona, I would say. Like, for example, think about Suspicion, of course, 
uh, Cary Grant is shown there as kind of that he may be this, this deceiving guy we, we learn if he is or not at the end. Maybe we will not spoil it now. But there is this, uh, you know, double-sided, uh, d- double-sided, um, there are this, there are these two sides to his character, I would say. And uh, this movie is interesting in its structure because it goes in parallel lines, I would say, because we have this two men, one, uh, as, it turn out, as it turns out, is evil, and we have two heroines, one uh, prays at the very beginning. There is this a very funny moment. There are a lot of funny moments in this movie, but the one is when this girl is uh, kind of taken care of by, by the dancer, and um, the dancer allows her on the very first night in the city to sleep at her place. Uh, before she goes to sleep, she, she prays, which is like this kind of comedic touch, also maybe saying us something about the religious attitudes of Hitchcock in a way. Well, um, I, I, I definitely, the, the scene sticks out, but not because she prays. I think when she starts praying, it's quite serious. And what breaks the scene into a completely perverse joke is that uh, her dog is leaking on her feet when she's <laughs> praying. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. And I mean, because Jill, uh, when, when Patsy, Patsy is playing, Jill is sort of like looking at her, you know, she rolls her eyes, you know, oh, this virtuous girl, you know. But uh, once the dog starts licking the girl's feet, I mean, this is a signature, yeah. uh, <laughs> I would say, Hitchcock's touch. And it's especially perverse because it seems that the dog is almost sexually possessive of his lady. Because then when she's about to go to the honeymoon, uh, you know, the, the dog is super jealous. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's like, you know, throwing a fit and he's barking and it's very difficult to placate him. He, was, he of course, senses that... Uh, that Levitt is um, is uh, evil. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the the whole role of the dog in the movie, and uh, he is uh, actually in the la- very last shot of the film, mm-hmm. the very last mm-hmm. shot. Film, uh, he also uh, he's very important because uh, do you remember when they first when Patsy and Jill come to the apartment, what they see? Uh, they see the dog has been playing around with the lingerie of the of, of Patsy. So you know he's uh, he's biting on her lingerie. So mm-hmm. he's really the dog here. I think is very very significant as this sort of mischievous little sexual yeah. spirit. You know, <laughs> yeah, the and first th- fetishist in Hitchcock movies. Of course, and the first <laughs> fetish is uh, uh, the feet of Virginia Valley, who plays the the, the who was the a big star by then. Who way. was a big star of silent film, and by the way, both leads Virginia Valley and Carmelita Gerarty are uh, actually American uh, mm-hmm. in this film. We won't go much into the context of how British filmmaking look at the time, but suffice to say that it was um, industry that was very much relying or at least hoping to mimic in many ways uh, American industry. Right, British mm-hmm. stars were not as big as American stars. Uh, and uh, Hitchcock actually started his um, film work in an American studio. That's right, on the British branch of famous players Lasky. Which That's later the... on b- became Paramount, Paramount but uh, they only operated, I think, in Britain for six yeah. years or yeah. something. Short period of time, uh, right. They closed down, but, yeah. you know, what, whatever Hitchcock learned on those American sets in Britain, he, he, he you know, exactly. uh, that stayed with him. So he, in a way, he's an American-trained filmmaker, and he always said that whatever I learned was from Americans and from the Germans. That's right. He said that well, immediately when he entered Famous Players Lasky, a British branch, he felt that he's kind of like in U.S., and he was really, uh, you know, an avid watcher of American movies. Griffith, of course, was the, was the, the master, in his opinion. And also um, American actresses, actors, they were drawing the audience to, to the theaters. So that, that's why it was important to have an American star in, in, in a movie. And what is funny, maybe we'll, we'll come to that later, but the film's producer, one of the most important producers of, um, in British film history, Michael Balcon, he praised Hitchcock on The Pleasure Garden, saying that it looks very American. Right. Which is funny, because, of course, we may, we may ask if, we, if 90 years later we agree with that, 90-something years later. That's one thing, and it also tells you that uh, British film industry um, at that time, you know, didn't look upon itself as very prestigious. You know, they always knew that, you know, more interesting things were going on in the United States or in Germany, for example. Uh, So that was... uh, you know, a notion that that later on grew into this almost stereotype that you know mm-hmm. a silent British film is nothing of interest, which uh, historians like um, Matthew Sweet, for example, in his film uh, Silent Britain, the documentary on silent um, uh, British films, 
is trying to actually dispel. He's saying that, that there was a lot of interesting things going on. But uh, there's no uh, arguing that for a young filmmaker like Hitchcock, at that time, you know, entering a set with American-trained professionals was something of an adventure. Exactly. And, of course, um, just to, to comment on the Silent Britain documentary, there we feel some kind of desperation in... Uh, kind of uh, defending British films of the era, but certainly uh, nowadays we have more and more opportunities to watch other filmmakers which uh, made movies at the time. Uh, for example, maybe we'll come to this later in the next episode, the, the early, the silent films of Antony Asquith are the important po point of reference when it comes to Hitchcock movies of the silent era. Absolutely, absolutely. The cottage on Dartmouth and um, shooting stars But also, I would say that probably Asquith and Hitchcock are the only names that uh, sort of survive, yeah. uh, as in our in our mm, director's names, of course, that survive in our mm, uh, consciousness. Mm, so uh, there is this melodrama shot in Germany and in Italy, mm, uh, uh, in Italy at Lake Como, uh, and uh, we have you know a very nice location scenes. Um, especially during the uh, the honeymoon. Um, but also, um, would you agree that this is really a film that announces very loudly that Hitchcock will be very often drawn to a um, woman's perspective in telling his stories, especially in the first scenes, but not, all, not only that? Certainly, uh, certainly that's the, that's the point, and we can wonder why, because there are, of course... I think several reasons. Firstly, we you mentioned uh, the the screenwriter, but uh, and the, the the author of the novel who was who was a she, right? But uh, we have also Alma Reville, whose influence on Hitchcock in this early stage is who really... is the assistant director on this film, exactly. and will of course keep on assisting Hitchcock on various projects yeah. uh, until 1950 and stage fright and and beyond. Uh, she will not be credited, but uh, she was always his. Uh, assistant in a way. And Hitchcock uh, often said that you know he was surrounded by by women, by creative women, and uh, pretty fairly, fairly, uh, pretty early on, he decided that women's perspective is really important in, and he wants to um, kind of show it in his movies also because of the of the box office uh, reasons because um, women were large part of the audience uh, at the time. So that's right. Certainly, it's interesting that we have the story of two women. Of course. Uh, when we look at this movie, let's say in a cold way, we see that uh, Hitchcock abandons Jill's perspective pretty um, pretty soon, I would say. We don't have many scenes with her, but they are all very interesting. But then he focuses on, on Patsy and, and his relationship with Levitt and Hugh. Mm -hmm. Well, Jill doesn't even get a uh, closer, uh, closure. I mean, she's, mm -hmm. she's completely abandoned by the film. The final uh, scene takes place, uh, you know, back at Patsy's place, but Jill is sort of forgotten. Um, it is interesting that Hitchcock would actually, you know, assume this sort of feminine uh, point of view. It's definitely clear in the very opening scenes when we see those old men leering, and they're, you know, the, 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 they are sort of despicable and they are definitely repulsive, you mm -hmm. know, in a way that they are leering over the bodies yeah. of the young girls. Um, and uh, and then there are those men who are actually stealing from Jill, uh, those young guys who also are not very sympathetic. Uh, it's shocking. The shocking fact, actually, that uh, John Russell, Russell Taylor brings in his book uh, is that because this was before the marriage, before um, he married um, Alma Reville, mm -hmm. uh, Alfred Hitchcock, uh, it was uh, during their courtship, let's say. And the shocking thing is that um, apparently the uh, woman who played the native girl, who isn't even in the credits, mm -hmm. uh, that tells you something also about the colonial she era, had to be replaced. Uh, her name is Elizabeth Papritz, and uh, she had to be replaced because the first actress was actually having her period at that time, and uh, the shocking information that John Russell, Russell Taylor gives is that Hitchcock wasn't aware of what period was. Uh, he didn't know what it was. So in this strict, strict Catholic upbringing with sisters and, you know, with mother, he didn't even uh, know the basic facts of life. I don't know if, if we are fully to believe this story, but uh, but it's there in the John Russell, Russell Taylor book. So this fascinating split in Hitchcock between, you know, perversity and... Um kind of very restrained restrained approach to sex is is there from the very beginning both in his movies and his biography because he he uh, emphasizes that he was a virgin back then and that as you said uh, and also Patrick McGilligan also 
uh, repeats this story. Who is another biographer yeah, of Hitchcock. Who is like probably the, 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 the newest biography is, is written by him. And also Hitchcock tells this story to Francois Truffaut in uh, Hitchcock Truffaut, uh, which I had the chance to, to read this, this morning as well. So it's there from the very beginning, but on the other hand, so this is this uh, very, uh, we could say, virginal part of Hitchcock, but there's also his story from Berlin, from year or two years before when he saw two women kind of kissing each other in a bed and he said that he remembered this image he mm, went to the apartment with these girls and with some other people from the company just by accident you know one of these crazy nights in 1920s Berlin and he uh, found himself watching that image which for him was something very interesting because he also says that he didn't really know how uh, children are born. I, I don't know if we should, or as you said, we should believe it like letter mm -hmm. by letter, but um, it comes in this movie, in this relationship, which uh, McGilligan um, described uh, the relationship between two girls. He described it as oh, sapphic. sapphic. Right, so ba basically he was taken to a gay bar in Berlin when he was on his one of his German trips, okay. and uh, he was um, allegedly shocked. Uh, but actually, I think he might have been shocked because... Uh, uh, let's not forget, I mean, we are talking about a uh, child not only of imperial era, but also of Victorian era, of Victorian morality. And I think this uh, figure of Victorian restraint, uh, a figure of uh, this deep sexual repression, sometimes incarnate, will appear in his films, like Mrs. Danvers in uh, Rebecca, for example, who is this mm -hmm. strictly um, Victorian figure of a governess, you know, who um, sort of, you know, uh, keeps the children's uh, sexual impulses at bay. And uh, uh, it's, it's many, many times in Hitchcock we will see those, uh, those figures. Uh, but also I think that uh, it's very interesting if you let's say we can do this experiment and look at The Pleasure Garden mm -hmm. as a movie made by a male virgin, right? I mean, that's an interesting <laughs> experiment, if that was yeah. indeed true. But it seems it was, right? It's, it, all the biographers agree that at this point, Hitchcock is a virgin. So so it's interesting interesting that his first film is actually called Pleasure Garden, so that would, <laughs> that would you know, indicate all the suppressed desire. Uh, but also um, there is a gay character or a gay episode of this fashion designer who is fashioning this very, very sumptuous 1920s mm. open flower dress for, uh, for Jill. He's definitely gay, uh, probably modeled on someone who Hitchcock saw in Berlin, I would, I would, I would, uh, I would guess. But also I, I think that the, if we are to take this uh, interpretation, Hitchcock is projecting himself probably on Hugh, on this very mm -hmm. faithful, uh, pure guy who is actually looking at Jill on the stage back when you know he's still in love with her, and he says, oh, my fiancé is dancing in a vaudeville, she's fantastic, you know? <laughs> and he doesn't even know, because he's so innocent, that actually, you know, she's probably already sleeping with some, mm -hmm. with some guys, right? The producer, right? or, yeah. Right. Uh, exactly, That's, that struck me when I watched this movie that there is this line that he, he will not marry her now because he needs to save some money, he needs to be higher up, and then he will marry her, which exactly mirrors Hitchcock's situation with Alma Reville, because as... Many stories tell uh, he didn't. He feel he felt a bit ashamed to speak to her because she was higher in, in the hierarchy in famous players Lasky. And then only a few years later, when he himself uh, was being promoted, he decided that now he can um, kind of uh, engage in a relationship with her. So we have this this mirroring of, of Hitchcock's situation in that in, in, in Hugh's character, who's a who's a um, lovable, sensitive, and uh, you know is a true very good character. Right, a good a good uh, Victorian colonial yes. boy, let's say, <laughs> and uh, and possibly a version of Hitchcock, or maybe a projection on Hitchcock's part. But also Hitchcock is also clearly unaware or aware of the second part of his personality, but also of anyone's personality, which is. Uh, which is uh, Levitt uh, in, the, in this film, which is sort of... Uh, actually, he cuts a very impressive figure of this sort of unbridled mm -hmm. desire, right? He's uh, only interested in Jill, f you know, uh, to satisfy him, se uh, him sexually. The second, you know, it, it, it happens on the honeymoon, he loses interest. Mm -hmm. Then when he uh, is on the boat and he goes to the colonies and she's waving to him, he's already looking at another woman in this quite elegantly edited sequence mm -hmm. 
And then when there is a wonderful image of um, uh, Patsy's hand waving to him, which is dissolving to another hand. Uh, and this is the hand of the girl, of the native girl, who is welcoming uh, Levin, uh, Levin at, uh, at the colony as his girlfriend. Uh, so, and, and physically, he's quite repulsive, I have to say. Like, he looks uh, sickly, you know, he's, he's thin, he's like corrupt by desire. Mm-hmm. And I think that maybe also Hitchcock's like maybe Catholic projection on like what desire does to you. Mm-hmm. It it turns you into this ghoul, this sort of golem. Because certainly we mentioned it's a melodrama, it's also a moral tale and you know at the end it's obvious that only uh, let's say healthy, honest people will survive and will have the the will live happily. Ever they will after. inherit the earth. Yeah, but also to um, what you mentioned, of course, it's true that he's he's driven by this sick sick desire and he's a he turns into murderer. You know, he's a sick personality. Maybe the the first uh, we could say I don't know you know seriously seriously psychologically disturbed his character, but also there is this. Um, it reminded me of, you know, Joseph Conrad and Heart of Darkness. Maybe it's going a little too far because, as we mentioned, it's more of a colonial kitsch than, you know, like a serious analysis of, of the colonial situation of, of white people living in colonial settings. But uh, I felt this pretty strong, that he's somehow corrupted by, by this environment, by this easy access to women, we could say, you know. Mm. He has... Um, it, She's not really his mistress. His, his, we could say, we should say, his uh, the, the lady in the in the uh, at the plantation is his um, sexual slave. We, we should we should say. Probably. Well, uh, I I would argue with that because she clearly loves him. I mean, uh, mm. she's I think she's romantically attached to him. Mm, she commits suicide when mm. when when you know uh, uh, he treats her violently at one point, and uh, from the way she treats she's treating him with this adulation. I would say there is a colonial element in mm-hmm. it because uh, he's almost. Like this white god kind of yeah. figure, very much yeah. from colonial imagination. But she is shown as this sort of like, in the world of this film, of course, as this simple-minded native mm-hmm. girl who completely loves him. And, and she goes into the sea. She, com- she commits a very romantic suicide. Yeah. Uh, with his help, it's, 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 it's uh, becoming a murderer. After, right, after right. But no, but you're right. Maybe that's kind of, maybe I'm reading too much from my contemporary perspective. And of course... Hitchcock doesn't give us enough clues, let's say, to really kind of we, we don't see this relationship, you know, well established. We could say because she's 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 uh, waiting at uh, waiting for him. That's right, and she's fascinated by him. That's true. But then he has some very strange delirious moments in this movie, which because I think we mentioned uh, we, we said several times it's it's a melodrama, and you can only look for several Hitchcock elements. But certainly, last ten minutes with its fast pace pretty fast and smart editing. It's this, let's say, it's a genuine Hitchcock climax, I would say. Of course, and uh, I, I, I'm, compl- I'm not knocking your interpretation of the of the Conradian angle, because first of all, Hitchcock will adapt Joseph Conrad, we will exactly. learn Secret, uh, agent. Secret Agent, and uh, second of all, uh, you could read this as a very, of course, unconscious, but a colonial fable or uh, almost like um, that it's, it's pushing the colonial notion to its edge because mm-hmm. uh, the one character that returns from beyond the grave as a specter, as a ghost, is actually the native girl because, uh, you know, he, as you mentioned, Levitt is having those delirious moments and he sees her ghost and that's probably, although I'm not sure, but we will discuss this, the only actual ghost that appears mm. in Hitchcock's films, like a, a real ghost. Maybe Madeline in uh, Vertigo mm-hmm. in some ways to Scotty mm-hmm. in a dream. Uh, but but here there's no question. It is like a, exactly. a ghostly presence. So again, a very melodramatic notion, but you know, the sort of ghost of the native girl mm-hmm. is something that I think also may be representing the sort of guilty conscience guilty of a colonizer. I, I would, I would, um, I would uh, uh, argue. And in this, in this sense, this movie is very interesting because it gives you this. It gives maybe not us because we're more interested in, let's say, Hitchcock's art, but people who want to study, you know, the, the um, gender, race, and stuff like that. They can really um, have a nice adventure with this movie because um, you, we mentioned that the first sequence. I will just come to back to this briefly because. In the context of Me Too, for example, it's still a perfect. It's a perfect sequence because we see step by step, let's say, how it happens in in this business. Because we, uh, you said these uh, these old men are repulsive, but also we, we got 
uh, we got a very nice POV of a man who's um, putting his glasses on and only then he can see clearly uh, clearly he can see clearly the women and then he goes backstage to talk with to, to one of the dancers so Hitchcock is pretty straightforward about about yeah, what's the, going on the mechanics sort of of the of the um, uh, sexual exploitation of the women and uh, you can definitely see that um, uh, this whole theater sequence is extremely similar to Ruben Mamoulian's Applause, by the way, the, the sequence in, in his film. So I wonder if he saw this film. Um, but also uh, there are other scenes which point to this theme that you mentioned. Um, there are also things that are incredibly old-fashioned and incredibly, <laughs> like, you know, they didn't age well, um, apart from, uh, you know, like this, this Prince Ivan. Prince Ivan, you know, yeah, the, Again, the Eastern my European. My favorite character. <laughs> you know, the Prince Ivan, who is uh, played uh, in the film by Karl Falkenberg. I mean, this is all this sort of this, this um, just stuff of, of 19th century melodrama, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it defi it's definitely um, aged, and uh, it would, it, I would say it would be even old-fashioned for David or Griffith, you know, to include something like Prince, <laughs> yeah. Prince Ivan. Uh, but, um, yeah, uh, any uh, other thoughts? Yes, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the representation of the city? Because, of course, uh, we can read in various sources that it was... Uh, shot um, in a studio, there is no really uh, city streets feel in this movie, which is pretty surprising because in the next episode we'll discuss The Lodger, which is totally different when it comes to atmosphere. Uh, in The Lodger you can really feel the, 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 the pace of the city. And here in this movie, I know it's his first movie, it wasn't a huge production, but you really don't have many exterior shots. It's really very, it's a closed movie in this way. It is, and to the point that you don't really know where, where it's going on. I mean, it, this could be the States or England or Germany, mm -hmm. and it, it was in a way all of those places, but you don't get a sense of London, for example, um, no, yeah, I mean, you're, 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 you're right. That probably had to do with the budgetary um, limitations. Uh, Russell Taylor and I guess also McGilligan, uh, they, they definitely described um, how cheap the production actually mm -hmm. was and how difficult was it for Hitchcock to manage the budget. You know, there were those misadventures on the way. Mm -hmm. They had to pay um, uh, the, the, you know... The, um, uh, Additional cost for a film, which was confiscated. Right, it was crossing the border. The border <laughs> and someone, you know, was jumping yeah. the train and they didn't have money for food. So, the, I mean, it was, it, was, it was a lesson in budgeting uh, mm -hmm. uh, learned the hard way. So I guess it's a pretty cheap film, but it looks great. I think it, it actually looks great. Looks great. Yeah. yeah, and... Uh, the, the, the other thing I want to mention is um, many books um, describe Hitchcock as first this, um, let's say, the, the guy working for Henley's telephone company, then uh, they say he designed titles uh, for silent movies, but I think um, underemphasized is this aspect of his work which concerns uh, art design, because he was art designer for several years. Um, and you can feel in this movie, of course, of course, the impact of um, not only German expressionism as a, you know, this um, most important part of German cinema, but generally the in, in interiors, except uh, especially in uh, Prince Ivan's uh, palace, as far yes, as I remember, yes, in definitely. the in the restaurant, you have these huge doors, really three or four times bigger than they should be, and you have this this grandeur which comes from. Ufa Studios, in a way. Absolutely, and you can imagine that had it been a Lubitsch film, it would be taken, you know, it would be actually told from the point of view of Prince Ivan, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and uh, you know, Patsy and Jill would be completely interchangeable and, and probably Hugh would be the ultimate butt of the joke, you know? But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we are in the same world. You are absolutely yeah. right. And uh, it's interesting because um, you can also read it up in the biographies that Hitchcock was on the set of Murnau's The Last Laugh. Mm -hmm. He was learning from Murnau. He loved The Last Laugh because it was told without subtitles. So that was intertitles. to say uh, intertitles. And um, one last thing that I wanted to add from the Charles Barr book is uh, very important to remember that we are watching this, these films, the silent films, but and we assume that they are in their final state, but actually mm. uh, it's important to remember that those films morphed all the time. I mean, the scenes would be interchanged in the, in the order, openings would be different for different projections, the music would be different. So it's not like w the, the version that we saw is the only mm. ultimate version. There is probably something missing, and uh, 
Uh, so it's it's also very important to remember that when you are doing this sort of very textual analysis, not to get too far because it's not like those films were fixed once and for all. They they were sort of fluid. Yeah. So uh, the cut may be an accident or the <laughs> let's say the wind of history because there is one real missing. So my question to you is, which version did you see? Did you see the tinted version or did you see the black and white version? I saw the tinted version that is uh, put out on DVD by. Network, Carlton Network, I think. Uh, they had the series British Hitchcock, so mm. that was the version. I think it was 61 minutes long. Exactly. I, yeah. al I also saw the 61-minute version, but I know there is uh, just black and white version, but I also saw the tinted one. Ah, okay, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, and, and I love the last title of the film, which is... Uh, Cuddles knew all the time. Cuddles is the name of the dog, and uh, <laughs> and Patsy says of the dog that oh he knew all the time. You know exactly. that that uh, Levitt was the evil, uh, that the evil guy. So um, that was the first Hitchcock film. Um, we will try to give you as many details on the next one. Uh, did you already rewatch The Lodger, the story of London Fog, for um, the next episode or not no, yet? No, I haven't yet, and I'm really excited because I I can honestly. Say that I don't, I didn't know Silent Hitchcock that well, but of course I saw The Lodger, but it was something like 12, 15 years ago, so years ago, and probably before the restoration, which is now available uh, in the Criterion Collection. We will watch it from the same Criterion disc, and uh, also next time we will mention briefly um, the lost Hitchcock film, The Mountain Eagle, which we mentioned this time as well. And really, with moving to episode two of our podcast, we will also move to the film which Hitchcock himself considered his number one, meaning it was the first real Hitchcock film, the first film also in which he appears and has two cameos, not one, two cameos. So we will discover all that uh, next time. Uh, so see you next time on Foreign Correspondence. Deeper into Hitchcock.